Welcome to today's webinar. I am Emily Bibbins Chun, the Executive Director of American Beauty's Native Plants, as well as the Synergy and Handpick Free Programs. And today's webinar is a joint collaboration between those two groups. We are so thrilled that you are here to join us today and hear all about Dr. Talamy's message. Before we get started, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. As attendees, you will, of course, hear Doug, but you will not be able to speak on, on audio. Uh, this is just to prevent background noise. We encourage you to share questions and comments, however. So please find the chat box. This is usually a button near the bottom of your computer screen that says chat. Pull that up and type out any questions, comments, or, or thoughts you have as, as Doug presents. We have our very own Tim Kane with Pride's Corner Farms who will be moderating that chat box, um, answering what questions you, you have that, that come up and, and he's able to answer, but then at the end of the presentation, Tim will be posing your questions to Dr. Talamy. Now I'd like to introduce Steve. Steve is, of course, with North Creek Nurseries, as well as co-owner of American Beauty's Native Plants. Steve will be introducing Dr. Talamy also. A quick note for those of you who are not familiar, American Beauty's Native Plants it has five licensed growers that I should point out here quickly. There are Midwest Ground Covers, Pride's Corner Farms, Willoway Nurseries, Saunders Brothers, and Sunset Farmstead. So you're welcome to contact any of those five for more information about American Beauty. And then on the Synergy side, we also have five, five uh, owning partners, and those are Over to Vest Nurseries, Saunders Brothers, Sheridan Nurseries, Willoway Nurseries, and Pride's Corner Farm. So we're thrilled to have everyone here and, and collaborating for Dr. Talamy's presentation. So Steve, I will turn it over to you to introduce Doug. Hey, welcome everybody. Um, it's an honor uh, today to introduce uh, Dr. Doug Talamy. Uh, I've had a uh, wonderful opportunity to get to know Doug uh, over many years now. And uh, I'll give you a quick uh, bio. Um, thrilled to announce that he was uh, just honored with uh, the T.A. Baker um, Award at the University of Delaware, where he has been a professor for 40 years in the Department of Ecology and Wildlife or Entomology and Wildlife Ecology. He's author offered at authored at least 104. Uh, research papers, uh, and his groundbreaking work is in the effect of uh, plants, especially native plants, on uh, and the interaction with insects, and uh, also how uh, they affect bird populations. He's offered, authored uh, three books, uh, one groundbreaking book that uh, brought all this into relevance in 2009 called Bringing Nature Home. In 2014, he co-authored a book with Rick Dark called The Living Landscape, Design and Beauty for Biodiversity in the Home Garden. And uh, most recently in 2020, uh, a book called Nature's Best Hope, which um, made it to the top 15 of the New York Times bestseller list, by the way. And uh, I'm gonna give you a quick little sneak peek he has offered, authored four books, and he'll have a book coming out uh, in hopefully in March of 21 called The Nature of Oaks. And maybe Doug can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, lastly, I'm happy to have uh, worked with Doug recently on the establishment of something he's going to talk about today, uh, the Homegrown National Park that he's introduced. And uh, there is a website called homegrownnationalpark.org. And Doug will give you more information about that. But uh, I would just really, uh, I'm happy and uh, welcome Dr. Doug Talamy. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I do want to talk to you today about my idea of what, what nature's best hope is. But one of the central messages this is built around is that nature, uh, the bulk of nature is, is built from millions of specialized interactions. A specialized interaction is, is one where one organism depends on another organism. Uh, so for example, 
if you ever wonder what is pollinating witch hazels, I mean, you can you can read that, oh, it's it's cyarid flies, fungus gnats and, and other flies. And you walk around during the day and you look, there's never any flies on these these flowers. They're blooming in the fall, of course, when it's cold. Well, it turns out that there are a, a group of moths called winter moths. This is one of them, the bicolored sallow, that if you go out at night when it's actually quite cold, uh, they're out there pollinating the the hemimelis. Uh, another specialized interaction, pileated woodpeckers depend on carpenter ants. That's what they feed their young. So you're not going to have breeding pileated unless you have the big trees that make the carpenter ants that support their reproduction. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilii, unless you have facilia. That's the only pollen that that bee can use to reproduce. As a matter of fact, pollen specialization is quite common in our native bees. Out of the 4,000 species of native bees we have, more than a third of them can only use the pollen of particular plants. We've got about 13 species around here they can only use the pollen of perennial sunflowers for example. You're not going to have Baltimore checker spot unless you have white turtle heads. So on and on and on. Nature is a series of very specialized relationships. But today these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes and it's on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908 Teddy heard that the state of Arizona is going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, he looked out over the edge and he said leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the formation of the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem, of course, is that today, um, that's not possible for most of the country. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine condition. And that's because we have, we have logged the country repeatedly. We've tilled it. We've drained it. We've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland. That's just four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We straightened our rivers and dammed them and you can spell that any way you want. We've polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas like kudzu is right here. So in short, we've carved up the natural world into tiny fragments of its former self. And each one of those fragments is too small and too isolated from other fragments to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. You might wonder why we've done this. Um, I wonder sometimes. I think the answer is we, we just thought our nest, planet Earth, was so big we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this at a pretty, pretty regular clip. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of the North American bird population. And now the UN's predicting that we'll lose a million species to extinction, possibly in the next 20 years, as if that's an option. Not an option, folks. Well, I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, this upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. Uh, it's a cure that'll take a small amount of, of effort from a lot of people, but that will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline briefly here. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, E.O. Wilson, the, one of the greatest biologists of all times, uh, still, still writing books, a professor emeritus at Harvard, told us what it would mean if we were to lose insects um, way back in 1987 with this paper. He wrote called The Little Things That, that Run the World. And his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems, which would collapse the food webs that support our animals. The amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, uh, and even many of our freshwater fish would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would, would rot as opposed to, to having um, rapid turnover in nutrients because of, of insect decomposers. You'd only have bacteria and fungi to do that job. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. The good news is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save ourselves, nature itself, but we're gonna have to change the way we landscape to do that. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We cannot, uh, we cannot create landscapes that don't support natural systems if we wanna stay on this planet for very long. And that's because we depend on what we call ecosystem services. So here are just some of the ecosystem services that plants deliver for us and everything else. 
like oxygen, produce oxygen. We all need that. They clean water, slow its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use. Enormously important one right now, carbon capture. Plants every, every day are, are pulling carbon out of the air and locking it up in their tissues and then pumping the extra carbon into the ground. Our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plants have put there over the eons. They build topsoil, they hold it in place, they prevent floods, they dampen severe weather and many other things. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. So developing landscapes like this or creating landscapes like this that destroy the production of those ecosystem services is simply not an option. It never was a good option, but today with 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet, um, it's, you know, it's, it's not a sustainable option at all. We need more ecosystem services today than ever before. There have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with, with the earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent, wrote in the early uh, part of the, the 1900s. <clears throat> one of the things he said was the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now, there have been a number of indigenous groups have been pretty good at doing that, but our huge Western uh, and, and Asian societies have been terrible at doing that. We're, you know, we're great at taking more than the earth has to offer and then moving on and doing that someplace else. So Aldo had a dream that we would actually develop what he called a land ethic. And he wrote about this in the Sand County Almanac. Um, his dream was that we could, we needed to use the land. We need to farm it and lumber it and graze and mine and do all those things. But uh, his dream was that we would learn to do those things gently. We could do those things without destroying local ecosystems. And that was what he called a land ethic. What I've always uh, been curious about is that he never talked about developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot be in the same place at the same time, cannot coexist, was so deeply embedded in the, in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day. It's still embedded in our own culture that he may not have even recognized it as an option. Well, my message today is that living with nature not only is an option, uh, I'm going to argue it's the only viable option that is left to us. You know, in the past, conservationists worked exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We need to turn that on its head now and we need to save nature where there are a lot of people because that is almost everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes. Thrive, not just, not just be present, but thrive in those landscapes. Where are we gonna start? Well, we can't ignore private property like this. That's because most of the US is privately owned. Almost 86% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we ignored private property and only did conservation someplace else, we'd be working at, at best with 15% of the land, not enough. So what we need to do is renew all parts of nature. Um, but we need, in order to do this, if we're restoring uh, nature in places where we've already dismantled most of it, we need to start with the species that other species depend on, the building blocks, because not all species contribute to, to um, ecosystem function in the same way. And one of the first things we need to do is establish a viable food web. Remember, it is plants that are capturing energy from the sun and they turn it into food. Well, that food is only meaningful for animals if it passes from plants to, to animals. And most animals, it turns out, do not eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants and that's something typically is insects and most of those insects are caterpillars. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So caterpillars are essential in food webs. Let's use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Um, many of you have heard me talk about chickadees in the past because we've got a lot of data about chickadees. They're seed eaters during the winter. 50% of their diet is seeds, but during, uh, particularly when they're reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, most of those insects will be caterpillars. And it turns out that um, chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. We have data to support that. Ashley Kennedy uh, did a citizen science project where she put out a call for uh, bird photographers to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they were carrying prey items to the nest. And they sent Ashley thousands of pictures. She identified the prey items in the bird's beaks and reconstructed the nestling diet of 20 of the common bird families in North America. 
the green bars are the percentage of those, those nestling diets that were caterpillars. And in 16 of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we took caterpillars out of, of the system. Most of our birds would not be able to success, successfully reproduce. Well, why caterpillars? What's, what's important about caterpillars? Several things. One of them is that they're soft. Um, so if you think of this guy as, as a, uh, like a little sausage with a very thin wrapper, the thin wrapper is exoskeleton, it's cuticle, it's not digestible, birds don't want a lot of that. Uh, and because they're soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your, your offspring without fear of injuring it. And if you've ever watched a parent bird feed their young, they're pretty rough. It's their beaks like a plunger, they just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our, our uh, smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious, very high in fat, very high in protein, very low percentage of chitin compared to most other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So a lot of a beetle is undigestible and they have lots of sharp edges. And it turns out that, that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now I talk about carotenoids, uh, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate, and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. We have to get them from plants and we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of our diet. Uh, well, where are the birds getting their carotenoids? They're getting in from the prey items, of course, that they eat. And carotenoids are not equally distributed among bird prey items. The first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other uh, prey items because they're eating the green leaves that have those carotenoids. Uh, the third uh, most uh, abundant carotenoid source are orthopterans, things like crickets and grasshoppers and katydids. Uh, here are the adult caterpillars right here, the moths and the butterflies themselves, far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. And here's the earthworm way over here. So the early bird gets the worm, he just doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Um, so it's really appearing that uh, caterpillars are not optional parts of, of bird diets. They may be essential parts of, of healthy bird diets. So let's, uh, for the time being, just accept birds need caterpillars. How many do they need? Is one or two enough? Well, let's go back to chickadees again, because they are a good representation of what a lot of birds are doing. How many caterpillars does it take to make a, a, a nest, a clutch of chickadees? Well, one or two is not enough. It takes many thousands, six to 9,000 caterpillars just to get them to the point where they fledge. And then the birds continue, the parents continue to feed the babies caterpillars for another 24 days after that. So many caterpillars to make a clutch of chickadees, a bird that's a third of an ounce. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and we do, because that's what we have these days as yards, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not make all those caterpillars, then we have insect decline. And it's certainly looking like insect decline is tied to bird declines. We went to the uh, original data that Rosenberg et al. published to, to show that we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years and divided those birds into two groups, the ones that are require insects at some part of their life history and the ones that don't, the doves and the finches that can reproduce uh, without insects. They actually gained some numbers over the last 50 years, but the birds that depend on insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This does not prove cause and effect, but it certainly does suggest that there is a relationship between declining insects and declining birds. So, uh, let's let's uh, make another small mental jump and say, uh, yep, we need caterpillars in our landscapes. How do we do that? That's, of course, a different goal in landscaping. In the past, we've landscaped in a way that made sure there were no insects around. So how do we landscape uh, in a way that would actually add caterpillars so that we can have other living things around? We can add caterpillars by adding the plants that make them but there is a catch and that is most plants don't support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to choose the ones that do. Uh, and, and we have to do that because caterpillars are really fussy about what they eat and the monarch butterfly illustrates it perfectly. If you want monarchs to breed in your yard and we do because they're disappearing, all your boxwoods and crepe myrtles and, and, and uh, calorie pears and burning bushes and all the plants from Asia aren't gonna make a single monarch because that's not what they eat, they eat milkweeds. Uh, so, got to have milkweeds. Why are insect herbivores host plant specialists? Why do they specialize on particular plant lineages? 
Well, they do that because plants have made them specialized. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there, at least in the summertime. It's not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. But insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants um, can only eat plants for which they have specialized adaptations that, that help them get around those chemical defenses. They have specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify compounds, behavioral adaptations, life history adaptations that allow them to eat those plants without dying. But it takes a long period of exposure to those plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. And that's why all these plants we bring in from other countries are so poor at supporting our local insects. They haven't been here long enough for our insects to adapt to them. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to, to reestablish functional relationships uh, in our human dominated landscapes, we've got to pick the plants that allow that to happen. And I'm going to give you three examples of how that works, um, starting with uh, our own house here in, in Oxford, Pennsylvania. I am sitting in that window right now. Um, it was uh, we're built on, on the, uh, 10 acres of a farm that was broken up into 10 acre parcels. Uh, it was a very old farm, uh, had been in production for 300 years. And the very last thing it did, the soil was exhausted and everything was to uh, mow it for, for hay. Well, the hay is really a whole bunch of, of uh, invasive species like multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle. And then they just called it hay. Um, well, we had to get rid of all that stuff once, once we moved in. And um, then we had to put plants back. Uh, and, and I chose plants to reestablish based in part on, on my desire to see whether we could really reestablish a lot of biodiversity here by putting the right plants back. So for example, I wanted to attract a Canadian outlet. I've never even seen a Canadian outlet. Uh, and that's what the that's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. But in order to have Canadian outlets, you have to have meadow rue. That's the only plant that they eat. Well, there's no meadow rue around here. It's been long gone with all the agriculture. So I got some meadow root seeds from someplace else and planted it and uh, grew very nicely. But um, this is one of the first things I tried. And I, you know, I really was doubting whether Canadian outlets would ever find my, my meadow root. So I didn't even go out and check the plants. But maybe after a month and a half, they were growing well. I did walk by and they were almost defoliated by Canadian outlets. They had found it right away. So now we have a good population of, of meadow root and Canadian outlets. So we've added two, pop, two, two species to the to the homestead here. Here's another example, goldenrod stowaway. I wanted to track this moth because I think it's pretty. I want to take its picture. You know, it wasn't no, no more complicated than that. But it's a specialist on Biden's Aristosa, ditch daisy. Goldenrod stowaway is a misnamer, has nothing to do with, with goldenrod. Well, I did know where some uh, ditch daisy was. There's a power line cut in Bear, Delaware. I got some seeds from there, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. Took about a year for the moths to find this plant, but they did. And now we've got a good population of both of those. So we've added four species now. Wanted hackberry emperors because it's a butterfly that ought to be here. But as its name uh, suggests, it is a specialist on hackberry and we didn't have any. So I planted hackberry. This took three or four years for the butterflies to discover the plants, but they, they did. This past June, I walked by one of my hackberry trees on one branch. There were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars. So another big success. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that eat goldenrod. <clears throat> there are 110 species of caterpillars that eat goldenrod, by the way. Like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidra flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Now this is what I'm waiting for, the goldenrod flower moth. It has not discovered our goldenrod yet. I don't know why. That's what its larvae look like. So uh, this, is, this is anticipation. This is like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and look for goldenrod flower moth. One of these years I'm gonna find it and that'll be a great day. Added Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. Um, it's a beautiful plant, particularly in the fall. A good ground cover climbs up trees without pulling them down. Uh, and it's a great host for a number of our sphinx moths. Things like the Pandora sphinx, that's what the adult looks like. 
the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx all depend on Virginia creeper. I wanted the zebra swallowtail because I think it's our prettiest swallowtail. I was pushing it here because we're at the northern limit. Zebra swallowtails are, are uh, specialists on pawpaws. And uh, of course we had no pawpaws here, but um, the nearest pawpaw patch that I know of is 26 miles south of us. So I didn't know if the uh, swallowtail would ever be able to get up here. And we did have to wait. We planted pawpaws, waited nine years, but they finally found it. In the meantime, the pawpaw sphinx came. I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx. And we got lots of pawpaws. I wanted the double tooth prominent because I just think it's a very cool looking caterpillar. Well, uh, they're elm specialists. We planted American elm, doing fine. They came right away. Evening primrose, it's just a beautiful moth. Planted evening primrose and the moth spends the day uh, hiding in the flowers like this. They don't hide very well. So that was another big success. <clears throat> And I planted lots of oaks. Now these are just examples of the trees or the plants that I've added to the to the landscape. <clears throat> but I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old because it's enormous. Uh, and and you know a lot of people see that as a downside for oaks. They say, well, I'm not going to plant an oak because because I'm not going to live long enough to enjoy it. Uh, well, unless you die the next year, um, you can enjoy it. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns or as two foot bare root whips. And right away, which by the way meant they were free, right away they started attracting the things that drive the food web in, in our yard, like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange headed epicolema, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks that we put in our property. And they come right away. This is a picture of a crocus geometer eating a pin oak that has just popped up above the leaves here, standing on the ground, eating it anyway. So your oaks start to contribute immediately. You don't have to wait hundreds of years. This is a picture of our house from the same perspective I took that first picture. I'm still sitting here up in this window. See, we've got lawn, we're very traditional, but just to illustrate, we put plants back. Uh, now I haven't, I'm sure I don't have all the plant lineages that were here originally, but I'm working on that. And every time I add a new plant to the yard, I get new species of moths. About four years ago, I made, um, I made it a goal to take a picture of every species of moth that I can find on our property. And I'm up to 1,030 species of moths that I have photographed on our property. That's a lot of biodiversity. As a matter of fact, we have 10 acres, but Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land area, we have 38% of all the moths that occur in Pennsylvania. And each one of those is bird food, uh, which is probably why we've recorded 59 species of terrestrial birds that have bred on our 10 acres, which is 40% of all the terrestrial birds in Pennsylvania. All I'm trying to say here is that if you put the plants back, it works, it works. We saw this headline, what, two months ago, the World Wildlife Fund says two thirds of wildlife have vanished since 1970. All I can say is not at our house. As a matter of fact, I, I, I'm sure we have increased biodiversity by at least two thirds because we put the plants back. And I offer this just as encouragement. We can turn it around. We don't have to accept these terrible headlines. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres. Will it work on smaller properties? Uh, well, that's a good question. Let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's uh, house in, in Kirkwood, Missouri. Um, Kirkwood, Missouri has a bad invasive problem from bush honeysuckle. So the first thing they did was get rid of their bush honeysuckle, but they're on 0.6 acres. So 18 times less property than, than we are. And they're in suburbia. They're surrounded by, by neighbors with the big lawns and all the traditional stuff. So after they got rid of their bush honeysuckle, they put in uh, some native plants and then they they also put a little water feature they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that have used their property. They're up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. Just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So the Terpsters are doing, doing really well on their 0.6 acres. 
Will it work in urban yards? Well, let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, because right over this wall here is O'Hare Airport, one of the runways. Right over here is Kennedy Expressway. And Pam has one tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. Well, she did the same thing. She got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature for the birds, and she started to count her birds. She's up to 116 bird species that have used her yard, including a woodcock. If you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to Pam's house. There it is, sitting right there. But what about uh, city centers? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, way back in, what, 2014, I was staring at this plant. Asclepias tuberosa, people call it butterfly weed, but it reminds me of a terrible marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So we're not going to call this butterfly weed anymore. We're going to call it Monarch's Delight. All right, I was staring at Monarch's Delight, uh, and the first thing I saw was two species of, of megachylid bee, two species of leafcutter bee. Um, one of which I don't think I'd ever seen before. I know they're leafcutter bees because they carry their pollen on their tummy, not on their, their legs. Well, leafcutter bees have very specific requirements. Not only do they need pollen and nectar, they need soft leaves, they, leaves like on red buds, because they carve at the edge of those leaves, uh, roll them up into a tube and stuff them full of pollen, and that's what they lay their egg on. That's how they reproduce. Then they put that whole package into a crack. Well, there was uh, a red bud growing right next to Monarch's Delight, and that's why those bees were there. There were also bumblebees there, uh, and, and I, I suspect that the, the blooms of the red bud, which are very early in the season, are what helped the bumblebees succeed there, because bumblebees every winter as queens, there are no workers, and they have to start the colony all by themselves, so they need a lot of very efficient early season blooms um, to, to be able to efficiently forage for uh, their, their pollen and their nectar to start their colony. So obviously there was enough there to support the bumblebees. Then I saw a monarch, actually I saw two monarchs foraging on Monarch Delight. Now this was 2014. 2013, I had gone the entire year without seeing any monarchs because that was the low point of the monarch population in the, in the East. Uh, and this was June. Um, so uh, we, monarchs don't usually get this far north uh, in, in June, so I was very encouraged. That maybe the monarchs were going to make it after all. Why were the monarchs there? Well, they had monarchs delight, but they also had, uh, this is purple milkweed was there in bloom, um, which of course not only provides the nectar that they need, but it's, it's the host plant. They get to reproduce. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. Middle of Manhattan. The High Line, of course, is a, it's an elevated railroad, uh, railway that was converted into a tourist destination. And this is the strip of, of native plants along the highway, High, high Line, that um, is such a tourist attraction. They're not 100% native, but there's a lot of them. There's the Monarch's Delight. This is Rick Dark. He, he uh, was after me to, to go to the High Line, see all the wonderful plants. I'm not much of a city guy, um, but finally he dragged me there and I, I knew I'd see pretty plants, but I want to see the things that are using those plants and I didn't think I would see anything, but I was uh, completely wrong, um, which is, it's such a, a hopeful message. If we, if, if thoughtful native planters can bring life back to the middle of Manhattan, uh, we can do it anywhere. But there are four things we need to think about in order to do it successfully. And one of them is we have to shrink the area we have in lawn. We've got at least 40 million acres of lawn in the US, <clears throat> which is the size of New England. And of course, the way we maintain lawn, it's an ecological deadscape. Uh, we're not going to get rid of lawn, and I'm not even proposing that we get rid of lawn. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a status symbol. We, we humans love our status symbols. But we can cut it in half, cut the area in half, put in important plants there. We can still manicure our lawn. We can still have our status symbols and, and be good citizens. Uh, but if we take half the area out of lawn and put in uh, uh, thoughtful native plantings in that other half, that's, we'd have 20 million acres to work with for conservation. If we do this at home, we can create a new national park that we call Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. And there are immediate benefits to, to reestablishing natural uh, interactions right where you live. You can develop, either for the first time or redevelop, a personal relationship with the natural world. I don't have time to go into all of the health benefits that are associated with doing that, but there are many. 
and you get to do it at your own time, at your own pace. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, millions of people there. It's also free, no travel hassles, and you get to experience the natural world alone. This is so important in terms of establishing that, that uh, personal relationship. It's particularly important for our kids. You know, if our kids don't have a relationship with the natural world around them, our kids are the future stewards of the planet. They're going to be lousy stewards if they don't know that they're supposed to be stewarding nature and that they need to. Um, and they need to, they need to discover it alone. Richard Louv talks about nature deficit disorder. Our kids are, are suffering from a lack of exposure to nature. So, you know, we're, we're trying. We put them on a bus with 30 other kids and a teacher and they drive for an hour and then they get out and walk around some natural place. The teacher tells them not to touch anything and then they get back in the bus and go back. And that's their exposure to the natural world. I'm sure it's better than nothing, but it's really exposure to 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have nature at home, they can go outside and they can learn they, alone, no parental supervision, see if they survive um, and they can learn about nature all on their own. They might even learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my own granddaughter who lives in Hawaii and this is her patch of nature. It's a little, little piece of lawn about 10 by 10 feet with a hedge, but there are anole lizards there. And she sent me this photo to tell me how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground uh, and you disguise yourself with sticks and leaves so the lizards don't see you coming. And then you crawl very slowly towards the lizard. No smiling. This is, this is serious stuff. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard and you catch the lizard, then you put it in an aquarium and there's your personal relationship. Now, I don't think uh, Zoe's gonna be doing this the rest of her life, but I guarantee she will remember hunting lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. If you wanna do more than hunt lizards, you get uh, Nature Play at Home by Nancy Stranisti. Dozens of examples of how you can get kids interested in the natural world right where they're living. Uh, speaking of Homegrown National Park, we have a brand new uh, uh, website up, homegrownnationalpark.org. Uh, and we're, we, we have this map. The idea is to get on the map. If you, if you uh, embrace this idea of converting part of your yard to, to um, natural plantings, you can put in your data and your dot where you live will pop up. The object is to, to watch the whole country fill in. And that's, that's the goal anyway. Anyway, it's supposed to be fun. We'll see how it works. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn and the plants we're going to put in where there was lawn. At least some of them have to be what I call keystone plants. Um, so this is, a, this is one of the most important things we found out in our lab in recent years. And that is that all native plants aren't, aren't created equal in terms of supporting these all important food webs. They're just about 5% of our native plants that are making about 75% of the caterpillar food that drives these food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food which means you know, 80 plus percent of our, our native plants, they're important, but they're not driving it. Uh, so we can't leave these guys out. The question no longer is simply, are natives better than non-natives? Um, certainly they, they are in terms of supporting nature uh, on average, but I can build an, an all native yard that uh, is very poor at supporting nature because there are a lot of natives are really well defended. The question really is, do we want ecologically productive plants in our yards? or ecologically destructive plants, things like, like the calorie pear and all those invasive plants that become biological pollution and, and escape our yards and cause huge problems. I get an email, I don't know, once or twice a year from, from somebody, people saying, don't I know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia grew in North America 7 million years ago. And according to these people that makes them native so we can plant them and everything will be great. Well. Um, yes, I did know they grew in, in uh, North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native or not, but I'm not going to bother because this is not our metric anymore. The metric is how productive are they? I don't care if, if ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago. They support zero species of caterpillars here today, and that's the important metric. So you can plant them, uh, but they're not going to support your local food web. What is? Well, in 84% of the counties of North America, oaks are number one. Um, there's no other plant genus that's as productive as, as oaks. 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic states, over 900 species nationwide. Um, so really important plants. And this is, this is the power of a keystone plant in my yard. So remember, I've taken pictures of 1,030 moss species. Just moss so far, I haven't gotten to the butterflies. We'll get there someday. 
of that 1,030 species, 906 have known host plants. So there's more than 100. I don't know what they're, they're eating at this point. Of the 906, 267 species used oak, um, which is more than half of all the species of, of moths that use oaks in all of Pennsylvania, just at, just at our house on, on 10 acres. We have 69 genera of native woody plants on our property, and only one of them is, is oaks, Quercus. And we have hundreds of genera of, of herbaceous plants. So oaks are, are representing less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity, but they're supporting at least 29% of our moth species diversity. That's what a keystone plant is doing. So imagine what would happen if we took oaks out of our property. We'd have far less biodiversity for sure. How do you know what the keystone plants are where you live? You go to the Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website and put in your zip code and the ranked list of both woody and herbaceous plants will pop up for your county. And it'll look something like this in an awful lot of places. This, you know, I stopped here because I ran out around. The lists are much, much bigger than this. Notice uh, that I say native oaks, native cherries, native wills. If you go to the nursery and say, I want to buy a cherry, chances are excellent they're almost guaranteed that you'll end up with an Asian cherry. Um, if you ask for a willow, you're gonna end up with a weeping willow from, from the, the Middle East. Uh, even if you ask for an oak, you could end up with, with Chinese oak or English oak. You've gotta specify that you want a native oak because if you don't, even though these are native genera, uh, if you get a non-native member of that genus, it's gonna reduce uh, caterpillar use by 65%. We've done that experiment. These are the top producing herbaceous plants in, in so many of the counties. Um, goldenrod's way up there, you know, all those species of asters that you have. Um, as a matter of fact, any of the asteraceae are all very high, particularly for, for uh, bee pollen specialists. With these three genera alone, the top three genera alone here, you get over 40 species of, of native bees that you would not be able to support if you didn't have those, those plants in your landscape. So we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants, attract a lot of moths to your yard, and then we're going to kill them at our security lights. And that, of course, is not the goal. Um, there's a lot of research, particularly from Europe, suggesting that light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect declines, uh, at least in the temperate zone around the world. Uh, and these are the, the ways that uh, it kills these insects through exhaustion, the moths flying around and around until it, until it dies of exhaustion, colliding with the light, getting incinerated, dehydration, the bat comes in and eats it. Um, bright lights at night, blind night insects, who knew? And then it keeps them from doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, this is actually good news because if this is a major cause of insect declines, it's also uh, one of the most solvable of our problems. It's easy, you turn off your light. Well, I know what you're gonna say. I can't turn off my light because uh, the bad man will come if I do that. All right, put a motion sensor on your security light so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you'll re realize is that the bad man doesn't come very often. If you don't want to do that, take the white light out, particularly the mercury vapor light, and put in a yellow bulb. Uh, because yellow bulbs are far less attractive to night flying insects, particularly yellow LED bulbs. Uh, if we switch to yellow LED bulbs uh, overnight, we could save billions of insects and also a ton of energy. Okay, fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Uh, well, in, uh, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, and in Chester County, oaks support 511 species of, of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, uh, will complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, the, the cocoon hangs from the, the branch, uh, and then the moth emerges and they do it again. It all happens on the tree. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. 480 of those species, 94% drop from the tree, and they wiggle their way beneath the ground and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is under the tree. But there is no leaf litter under the tree and we mow and compact our soil to the point where the caterpillars can't get underground. So this becomes an ecological trap. And let's face it, we see these landscapes everywhere. The moth comes in, lays its eggs, the caterpillar develops, drops down and dies. Uh, and I'm sure this is one of the major reasons we've got insect declines uh, in these human dominated landscapes. And of course the cement landscape is even, even less of an option. I'm not trying to discourage trees and cities. I'm trying to discourage the profligate use of cement as a default landscape. We know it's a terrible idea for the watershed, but it's also terrible for biodiversity. Come back here. 
this is what most people do. They got a big tree and a big lawn and nobody's measured what the success rate of those caterpillars is in a situation like this, but I guarantee it is better in a situation like this where you have the tree and then a layered landscape. Maybe a dogwood here, a native azalea, you've got your ferns and your ground cover. This is a safe site. Caterpillar drops down, it's easy to get underground, it can spin its cocoon, nobody's going to squish it, nobody's going to walk on it or mow it. This is where you create your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink your lawn, you put these big beds around your, around your trees. And again, safe sites. This is where you use your, your ground covers, your wild ginger, your may apples, your foam flowers, um, all of those things, With native pachysandra, great safe sites. Ferns, look at this, is, this is a hotel, but it still is habitat because of these ferns. Uh, another, another grad student, Desiree Naranjo, has um, demonstrated through her research that there is room for compromise in our plant choices. Uh, inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C., she studied uh, the sustainability of chickadee populations depending on the landscaping uh, where the, the birds were breeding. She compared landscapes that were primarily, that were dominated by native plants, none of them were 100% native, compared to landscapes dominated by introduced plants. When the landscapes were dominated by introduced plants, they had 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, 75% less bird food for those chickadees. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So even though there's a nest box up, chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try. If they did try, they, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive, make it to fledging. If they did make it to fledging, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And you might say, oh, those aren't huge differences, but if you put all that together into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of woody non-native plants in your landscape from none to 100%, this is what you get. The dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. If they reproduce at this rate, um, you've got a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you reproduce at this rate, um, where you're making more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you're down here, you've got a shrinking population. Fewer babies than adults die every year. Right here is where those lines intersect. So around 30%, if you, if you have 30% or less of your, your woody plant biomass, being non-natives, you can have a sustainable breeding bird population. But if you exceed 30%, you're down into this, this range. Uh, so this is, this is good news for two reasons. This is the first time this has been measured for any bird anywhere. Uh, so if you doubt that, that the landscape plant choices actually influence other things uh, that, that might be living in your yard, this study ought to convince you that it does. But this is the area of compromise that I'm talking about here. You can have your ginkgo, you can have your crepe myrtle, you can have anything that's not invasive as long as it doesn't exceed 30% of the woody plant biomass and still have a, a, uh, um, a sustainable uh, landscape in terms of breeding bird population. So in other words, at least 70% woody plant biomass. Uh, and that's good news because if my message was you can't have any non-natives at all, very few people would be listening. Remember, it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It is the absence of native plants. Can native plants be used in formal designs? Of course they can. This is a, a garden, a developing garden in um, North Carolina, uh, where they're starting to replace uh, all of these plants with natives. Here's Joe Pye. Notice, notice I didn't say Joe Pye weed, it is not a weed. Uh, and they're gonna replace all these with natives and send it to me just to show that formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in, in formal landscapes in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a, a pollinator garden into a traditional uh, uh, suburban landscape like this? Of course we can just just put a fence around here. This is not going to offend anybody. It's beautiful. It will it will service a number of species of bees. It's not very big. Could be bigger, but if everybody did it, there'd be enough. Or you can make it a little bit bigger. This is a Drew Latham uh, design here. Uh, so think about the amount of life that is here versus the amount of life that is here. That, that's all we're saying. Um, I think we've made three missteps in the early years of, of conservation. And the first one is we've assumed that nature is important, but it's not essential. We like it, uh, but you know, when push comes to shove, when resources are short, nature always takes a back seat. And of course, that's all the time. Resources are always short. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out and they had this wall size 
poster which it's, to me it epitomizes what our society thinks of, of uh, conservation. And this includes top conservation biologists, includes Teddy Roosevelt. We've got to save wildlife, save nature for future generations to enjoy. And that's true. But to me, that suggests uh, that nature's there just for our entertainment. It is much more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's that simple. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. And by doing that, we've restricted conservation efforts to, you know, very small, untouched areas, which means we've condemned them to failure because they're not big enough or connected enough to sustain the nature that we, we need. David Quammen has an excellent analogy between Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. This is not 71 Persian rugs. It's 71 rug fragments, none of which are functioning as a Persian rug. And this is, of course, what we've done to our, our ecosystems. UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards. So what we need to do is put the plants back. We need to glue our rug back together again, focusing on those important plants, not just to make biological corridors where plants can, and animals can move back and forth between viable habitats, but to create viable habitats in between those existing ones. In other words, we're gonna start to share our human spaces with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave earth stewardship to a few specialists. You know, a few conservation biologists, ecologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. And I don't know why, because every human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody have the responsibility of good Earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a, a Cherokee elder, once said that the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We're great at teaching the I have rights one. We've been terrible at teaching our obligations to stewardship of, of planet Earth. We've got to get better at that. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but it is a good living. But you can save it where you live. I'm excited about this approach because it empowers each one of us. You know, so many of us feel powerless because the Earth's problems are so huge. You say, well, there's nothing one person can do. But that's not true. Go out and plant that oak, plant that pollinator garden, shrink your lawn, get rid of your invasive species. One person can do that and you will see the results. You become an important cog in the future wheel of, of conservation. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the entire planet's problems. You will get depressed if you do that. Just worry about the piece of planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you're going to focus. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy. Help an, a, a, a local park or preserve. They need it desperately. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one has the power and the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and ultimately our own fate. Uh, I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope, and I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much for listening. Well, Doug, uh, as always, uh, incredibly inspiring and a, and a, and a great message. And uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of people who have asked some questions. So if you have a little okay. bit of time, I will. Yep. Uh, well, uh, the first one I have is from Brad. He, uh, he asks, how do you answer questions regarding quote unquote native ours versus native plants and the benefits, if any, if native ours can offer? Uh, okay, uh, you know, I've been asked that question for a long time now. For a long time, there was essentially no research on it. So I was just guessing. Um, since that time, uh, we've done a study. We did one in collaboration with Mount Cuba and Annie White at the University of, of Vermont has, has been looking at it. We looked at what happens to the insects that eat leaves. Uh, so not, not the flowers, not pollinators. Um, looking at six cultivar traits, six common cultivar traits, so things like taking a green leaf and making it red or purple, uh, leaf variegation, um, enhancing fall berry size, 
uh, taking a tall plant, making it short, introducing disease resistance. Those are the types of traits we looked at. And we did a common garden experiment where we had the straight species and the cultivar growing right next to it. And then we evaluated insect use for three years. We found that the only cultivar trait that consistently reduced insect use was taking uh, a green leaf and making it red or purple because that introduces anthocyanins to the leaf and those are feeding deterrents. So all those red leaf cultivars that we love, um, that really is deterring the, the uh, benefit of, of those cultivars in terms of uh, you know, the leaves providing nutrients. As far as uh, flowers go, um, Andy's looked at that. The, the, um, you know, the news isn't quite as good there. The, the real answer is it depends. Uh, there are cultivars that actually increase nectar load and you have more pollen visitors. But um, typically we like to fool with flowers for aesthetic reasons. We make the petals much bigger. We make an echinacea look like a zinnia. You know, we change it so that people buy it. And the chances that we inter interfere with specialized bee relationships really increases when we, when we do that. Um, people are just starting to look at the nutritional changes that might happen with nectar and pollen when we fool with it. That's very young research, so, so we're not sure, but um, more often than not, fooling with flower color and shape does interfere with, with pollination, but not always, but not always. The one thing I don't, uh, that discourages me about, about cultivars is that most of them are reproduced clonally, so you are loading the landscape with zero genetic variability. And, you know, we're in, we're in uh, the middle of climate change here where it's, that's not the gradual warming of the planet. It's, it's wild erratic swings of the climate. You know, what, last week we went from 60 degrees to 30 degrees in 12 hours. I mean, this is rough on animals and plants and you need genetic variability to be able to handle that. Uh, so I'd love to see, you know, if we have desired traits and there's a lot of traits that are important like disease resistance that we could, we could get those traits in there without losing that genetic variability somehow. That would, that would be great in my opinion. But a lot more research needs to be done. So there's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> um, Richard is asking, uh, considering the issue with BLS and oak trees, which oak species do you recommend for the Northeast? And he said specifically New Jersey. Okay, so is that, is that uh, oak leaf scorch? Is that what BLS is? I, I've been trying to figure that out myself, so I, I, I was hoping you'd know. Well, that, that's the one I'm familiar with, particularly New Jersey, and that hits the red oak group a lot harder than the white oak group. Um, there is some resistance to that. I think this is going to be one of those. It's going to be like the dogwood anthracnose, where it goes and kills the ones that aren't resistant, and then we end up with the resistant ones, which took you know, 40 years. Uh, and I think that's going to happen too. I've got it right on my property here and I've got some black oaks that are dying, but there's others that aren't. Um, so if you're choosing an oak right now, because of, of the prevalence of that, I would choose something from the white oak group. Uh, and that, and we just dodged that question, but I have heard foresters say, well, we're not going to plant any more oaks. No, that's not the solution because we need to get the resistant varieties out there and let natural selection take its its course so that um, you know eliminating these powerhouse plants from our our forests is just not the answer that's too devastating in, in and of itself well tim is asking uh if there's only one thing one thing a homeowner can do to support caterpillars what would it be it'd be plant one of those powerhouse trees. Most, most yards can easily accept an extra tree. Many of them can accept a lot of extra trees. So um, you plant that tree and while you're doing that, you put a bed around it and then you've shrunk the lawn at the same time. So you've, you've added your carb, you're sequestering carbon, you're supporting the food web, um, your, your, uh, well, depends on which tree you plant. You're probably not helping pollinators too much, although some trees are really good for pollinators, but oaks aren't. They're wind pollinated. <laughs> but anyway, you're doing lots of things. That's the easiest thing to do. Uh, and and uh, the nursery industry will get mad at me for this, but plant a, a small tree because it's a much higher rate of survivorship and it's much cheaper and it grows fast and develops a big root system. It's very healthy doing that. Sorry. <laughs> okay, that's okay. 
Steve, uh, Steve is asking, can you comment on the Great Dixter Biodiversity Audit that showed their ornamental garden had the highest biodiversity? Is this the one in England? Good question. Let me see. Uh, yeah, that, that I'm not sure of that. That's in oh, hold on a second. Yes, yes, that is the case. Okay, yeah, um, really complicated answer. I haven't studied it. I'm not, I've never been to England, so I'm, I'm just guessing. But um, England has already lost a lot of its specialists. Okay, so what's left are generalists that can use uh, a lot of different plants. Uh, but there also was uh, a, a lot of people will throw the insects that use flowers, all the pollinators and flower visitors in with caterpillars. They just start counting insects. Uh, and you know, a zinnia, it's a non-native plant, but it's a, it's a nectar. Uh, it's like putting out a hummingbird feeder. All the things that like nectar go to zinnias and they count them and they say, see, there's, there's no difference in the amount of insects here. So it depends on which insects you're talking about. The ones that are predicted to suffer the most from native versus non-native are the specialist bees, and I don't see them broken out in that, that measure, and all those specialist caterpillars, 90% of them. Um, so there's no way that a non-native garden is going to support more specialist caterpillars. Um, and and if, if they do, I, I got to go see that for myself because that goes totally against all the theory and anything I've ever experienced. There's my answer. It's a, it's a, I don't know enough about it to, to, you know, counter it well, but that's what I suspect is going on. Doug, do you, uh, do you have, uh, or could you recommend uh, any resources uh, uh, that, uh, that for finding out which plants are, are host to caterpillars uh, local to the Northeast? What would you say is your, uh, your best resource for that? Well, you know, that's what that native plant finder does. So not only will it give you the number of caterpillars, but you can, you can go backwards. You can, you can put in a particular plant and it will tell you which, which species of caterpillar use it or put in the caterpillar and tell you which plants it uses. If you, if you don't want to play with the web, uh, you can get Dave Wagner's uh, books on, on caterpillars, the caterpillars of Eastern North America, and also the owlets, which unfortunately is out of print. So you can get it on Amazon for a mere 400 bucks, but uh, those are the good good sources. Thank you. So um, uh, the chat box is busy right now, Doug. So uh, you're obviously <laughs> got people engaged. So Katrina is asking, is planting a grouping of native shrubs still beneficial as compared to planting a single native tree? Um, from the perspective of, uh, you know, these derechos that come and blow all our trees down. The, uh, what is recommended is that we plant groupings of plants so that the roots interlock and you have to plant them young so that they grow and interlock their roots the way they would in, in a forest. If you go into a, a, an undisturbed forest, which is hard to find these days because of white-tailed deer, you still see uh, the, the roots of trees interlocking with each other in a matrix, which makes them very difficult to blow over. Uh, when we plant isolated specimen trees, and then you get a whole bunch of rain like we've had, and, and um, the root ball just lifts up and over it goes with a, with a big wind. Uh, and then you get property damage and sometimes even death. It's a huge problem. So that's what we're recommending is that you plant tree groves uh, and I've got lots of pictures of, of um, you know, big oak trees. They're planted like on three foot centers. And I planted, they were there, but that's how they grew up. And they're there because they haven't blown over. The other guys have. Uh, so um, other than that, I, I uh, you know, it's not that an isolated tree isn't going to support wildlife. It will, but it's, it's just more vulnerable to the extreme weather that we're getting. All right. And here's one more. People are always looking for a lower maintenance garden. Do you have any recommendations on how we can help convince people to choose native gardens, which might be more work rather than the ecological wasteland? Well, I guess sitting on a mower and mowing uh, three acres is, um, you can get three acres worth of maintenance in a short period of time. It's still work, but you know, most people don't garden, they hire somebody. 
So uh, <laughs> once you get your native garden established, maintenance really does drop off. Uh, you don't have, have that weekly giant lawn to mow. Um, it, but there's no garden that's maintenance free. And of course, getting it established is it's work. There's no doubt about it. So what I would like to see is that we have a much more robust, um, it's an unoccupied niche right now of what I would call ecological landscapers or ecological gardeners who people can hire. Instead of hiring your lawn service, say hire, hire these people, you know which plants to put in, you know how to get them established, you know how to maintain them. Um, and, and just, you know, put, put your money in that direction. That way it's no more work than hiring your, your lawn mowing service. But I don't want to pretend that a native, a native plant garden is, you know, is maintenance free. It's whether it's native or not, right plant, right place is still operating. And, and if you do that, um, they will be healthy, but uh, nothing's maintenance free. All right, one final one, and I uh, really appreciate you hanging in here, uh, Doug. Uh, you talked a lot about uh, a, pers a personal relationship with nature. Uh, what's, uh, what's your personal relationship for, uh, for, with nature that you most enjoy? You know, I've had so many through my life. Uh, and and uh, I remember telling a story in, in Bringing Nature Home. Probably the first one was when I, I watched the bulldozer fill in the polywog pond as I was watching the little, little babies hop out. That was an intense personal relationship and it, it told me an important lesson right there. But, um, you know, right now, uh, I, I, I like caterpillars, you can tell that. And there are so many of them out there that discovering a new one is really exciting for me. And when I actually plant a plant and it comes, you know, say, wow, science has predicted this really works. That's exciting to me. But uh, if we get a new bird at, at the house, you know, I, all of this stuff is, is exciting to me. Um, so, you know, I go outside, it lowers my blood pressure, lowers my, my, my stress hormone. And, you know, I need to do that after days like yesterday, I need to lower my stress hormone. Uh, so nature's really valuable that way. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think that's been your message for a long time. And, uh, you know, speaking for, uh, synergy growers and for, uh, for, uh, American beauties, native plants, I got to say, I really appreciate, uh, your message, it really hits home, and and uh, quite honestly, uh, I, I need to, I need to hear it more. I'm sure everybody else does because it it really does give a very personal aspect of what people can do, and I really appreciate uh, you coming on and doing that for us today. Absolutely. Thank you, Doug. Really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank you all. Just a quick reminder to attendees: the next session that American Beauty's Native Plants will have here later this afternoon at three o'clock is our very own Tim Kane will be back discussing why American Beauties. So if you need the login for that, stop by one of the Growers Business Hub booths. Uh, I know it's up at the Pride Corner Farm Business Hub, uh, as well as Willoway and, and the other AB growers. So stop by one of their booths and we hope to see you at three o'clock Eastern time today. Thank you all so much.